Hello and welcome to NS News Live from Islamabad. I'm Hira Mustafa and these are the headlines. India has lodged over 323,000 new COVID-19 infections and more than 2,700 deaths in the past 24 hours. In Pakistan, 142 people have died from the virus and over 4,400 tested positive overnight. Meanwhile, the U.S. says it will start sharing up to 60 million doses of AstraZeneca's vaccine with other countries in coming weeks. Globally, the virus has claimed more than 3.1 million lives and infected over 147 million people. In Myanmar, heavy fighting has erupted after an armed ethnic group captured a military base near the country's eastern border with Thailand. Karen National Union spokesperson said they have burned down the outpost and are checking on deaths and casualties. The clash comes as the military junta pledged to positively consider ASEAN suggestions to end the turmoil. Israeli police have clashed with Palestinians a day after the removal of barriers outside Jerusalem's Damascus Gate. The occupying forces arrested several Palestinians who gathered at the East Jerusalem Plaza to celebrate the removal of barricades. Human Rights Watch said Israel is pursuing policies of apartheid and persecution against Palestinians that amount to crimes against humanity. The talks between Iran and the world powers to revive the 2015 Iran nuclear deal were resumed today in Vienna. In a statement, the EU's political director Enrique Mora said the EU's possible return to the pact and its implementation will be discussed. Meanwhile, Iranian President Hassan Rouhani said the world has no choice but to agree with Iran and lift sanctions. Well, these were the headlines. News in detail coming after the short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Now the news in detail. India has lodged over 323,000 new COVID-19 infections and more than 2,700 deaths in the past 24 hours. Globally, the virus has claimed more than 3.1 million lives and infected over 147 million people. More on the pandemic in this report. With an exponential increase in global cases, inoculation challenges and fears of further economic contraction, the end to the COVID-19 pandemic seems nowhere in sight. India has called on its armed forces to help tackle the devastating crisis. Authorities say oxygen will be released from armed forces reserves and retired medical personnel will join health facilities that are struggling under the strain of cases. WHO's chief scientist Soumya Swaminathan says the actual number of cases in India is being significantly underreported. Moscow says New Delhi will receive the first batch of Russia's Sputnik V vaccine on May 1st. Australia says it will suspend all direct passenger flights from India until May 15th. Meanwhile, the WHO says millions of children are at risk from other life-threatening diseases, mainly because COVID-19 has severely disrupted their regular immunization process. The pandemic has caused several disruptions to immunization services around the world. New WHO data shows that as a result of COVID-19, 60 immunization campaigns are currently suspended in 50 countries. Meanwhile, within a week of lifting a ban on Johnson & Johnson's vaccine, U.S. CDC has warned people getting the shots to watch for blood clot symptoms. However, the U.S. says it will start sharing up to 60 million doses of AstraZeneca's vaccine with other countries in coming weeks. Canada has announced to send the Army and Red Cross to its worst affected province, Ontario. Meanwhile, amid unprecedented spikes, Turkey has announced a complete nationwide full closure from April 29th until May 17th. Avrupa'nın açılma sürecine girdiği bir dönemde We have to bring down the number of our cases below 5,000 
at a time when Europe entered a period of easing the restrictions. Otherwise, it will be inevitable for us to face the heavy consequences in every field, from tourism to trade and education. Thailand has reported 15 deaths, setting a new daily record for the third time in four days, despite new shutdowns in Bangkok and other areas. Pakistan has registered 142 fatalities from COVID-19 in the past 24 hours. The health ministry says the death toll has risen to 17,329. The ministry reported 4,487 overnight infections. It said nearly 805,000 people contracted the virus so far, out of which almost 700,000 have recovered. The number of active cases has jumped to over 87,000. The ministry said more than 5,000 patients are in critical condition. In Myanmar, heavy fighting has erupted after an armed militia captured a military base near the Thai border. A spokesperson for the Karen National Union said the camp had been burdened down. A Thai official in Mai Hong Son province said one person had been wounded during the fighting. This comes as the junta said it will positively consider ASEAN's suggestions on ending the turmoil. Meanwhile, anti-coup activists have resumed protests in Mandalay and Yangon. Activists say security forces have killed more than 750 civilians in the crackdown on protesters so far. Israeli police have clashed with Palestinians a day after the removal of barriers outside Jerusalem's Damascus Gate. The occupying forces arrested several Palestinians who gathered at the East Jerusalem Plaza to celebrate the removal of barricades. Meanwhile, the Human Rights Watch says Israel is committing apartheid and persecuting Palestinians. In a report, the International Rights Watchdog said Israel's actions amount to crimes against humanity. The watchdog called on the International Criminal Court to investigate the systematic discrimination against Palestinians. The talks between Iran and the world powers to revive the 2015 Iran nuclear deal resumed today in Vienna. In a statement, the EU's political director, Enrique Mora, said the U.S. possible return to the pact and its implementation will be discussed. Mora noted that although nothing has changed on paper, but a lot has changed informally. He said the U.S.-Iran distrust and the extraordinary hostility from Arab countries and Israel against the pact are the major hurdles going forward. Meanwhile, Iranian President Hassan Rouhani said the world has no choice but to agree with Iran and lift sanctions. The United States says it will seek cooperation with China even as it competes with Beijing. At a press briefing, State Department spokesperson Ned Price turned the U.S.-China bilateral relations multifaceted. Price said Washington needs to mobilize its resources and work with allies to compete with China on some fronts. However, he added cooperation with Beijing in areas such as climate and Iran nuclear issue remains open. This comes a day after China vowed to step up its support for Russia amid tightening Western sanctions. Turkey has urged the U.S. to reverse its declaration that the 1915 Armenian killings amounted to a genocide. Addressing a press briefing in Ankara, President Tayyip Erdogan said the wrong step will harm bilateral ties. Erdogan said he expects to discuss all issues with U.S. President Joe Biden at a NATO summit in June. He again called for Turkish and Armenian historians to form a joint commission to investigate the events. Biden is the first U.S. president to formally label mass killings of Armenians during World War I as genocide. Turkey accepts that Armenians were killed during the Ottoman period, but denies the killings were systematically orchestrated. Greek and Turkish Cypriots are set to meet in Geneva today in a UN-led summit to discuss unresolved ethnic issues. The three-day summit is aimed at exploring the opportunity to restart a peace process four years after the collapse of talks to reunify Cyprus. The meeting will be attended by Greek, Turkish, British foreign ministers and Cypriot leaders from both Turkey and Greece. Cyprus President Nikos Anastasiadis said the Greek Cypriots are ready to attend talks with determination and political will. 
Anastasiadis added he hopes the Turkish side attends the talks with the same zeal because the divergence will be harmful to both sides. The talks follow prolonged tensions over gas reserves in the eastern Mediterranean that called for the need for settlement in Cyprus. The United States and the European Union have rejected redrawing the Western Balkan borders. The idea was floated after an unofficial diplomatic note was circulated among EU officials. U.S. State Department spokesperson Ned Price said changing borders would only increase regional tensions. EU Chief Spokesperson Eric Mammer said Brussels does not favor any geographical changes. The document proposed breaking up Bosnia and merging Kosovo with Albania. It also suggested incorporating parts of Bosnia into Serbia and Croatia to aid European integration. The diplomatic note has not been claimed by any country and could not be verified by for authentic city. The US and the UK have imposed sanctions on a member of Guatemala's Congress over alleged corruption. In a statement, the US Treasury said it blacklisted Congressman Philippe Alijos Lorenzana and a former chief of staff, Gustavo Adolfo Alijos Cambara. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the Kurds support Guatemala's effort to end corruption. In a statement, he said the move comes as a part of Washington's commitment to supporting improvements in governance in Guatemala. The sanctions freeze any U.S. assets of the blacklisted people and bars Americans from dealing with them. Meanwhile, Britain also imposed sanctions against Lorenzana along with the Honduran congressman for facilitating bribes. More news stories coming up after the short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Britain has sanctioned 14 Russians in the first use of a new power to fight corruption abroad. The Russians were implicated in what the government described as a $230 million fraud. The measures freeze the assets of the officials and bar them from visiting the UK. Britain's new Magnitsky Act gives the government the right to penalize those involved in serious cases of corruption. Sanctions were also imposed on three people accused of corruption in Honduras, Nicaragua and Guatemala. The U.S. welcomed the sanctions and said they strengthened efforts to counter corruption globally. French President Emmanuel Macron has urged his Russian counterpart to reduce tensions with Ukraine. In a phone call, Macron also expressed grave concern over the health of jailed Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny. In a statement, the Kremlin said Vladimir Putin drew attention to the provocative actions of Kiev. He noted that Ukraine is ignoring the provisions of the Minsk agreements. Putin also highlighted the recent spat with the Czech Republic, saying Prague's accusations were absurd. The political process in Libya, the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh and the COVID-19 response were also discussed. Both presidents reaffirmed their intention to continue close cooperation in the Normandy format. Russia's foreign ministry says it has expelled a Ukrainian diplomat in a tit-for-tat move. Earlier, Moscow and Kiev expelled a diplomatic each after Russia accused a Ukrainian council of trying to obtain classified information. Ukraine's foreign ministry called the decision another provocation. The ministry said it will also expel a Russian diplomat from the country. Tensions have soared in recent weeks over a Russian military buildup near the Ukrainian border. However, Russia said last week it had begun returning the troops to their permanent bases. In Chad, the new military rulers have named a civilian politician, Albert Bahimi Padaki, as Prime Minister of the Transitional Government. This comes a week after the death of President Idris Deby on the battlefield. Opposition leaders dismissed the appointment and said it is not up to the military council to designate a premier. A military council headed by Deby's son has said it will oversee an 18-month transition to elections. Mohammed Idris Deby has been declared the national president and dissolved parliament. But the military council is facing international pressure to hand over power to civilians 
as soon as possible. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has called for an immediate withdrawal of Eritrean troops from Tigray. The State Department says Blinken held a telephone conversation with Ethiopia's Prime Minister Abi Ahmed. Blinken said Eritrean and Amhara regional forces are contributing to the growing humanitarian disaster. The Secretary noted his appointment of a special envoy for the Horn of Africa. He said Ambassador Feldman would travel to Ethiopia in the coming days. However, Ethiopia says it is committed to probing human rights violations and providing aid in Tigray. Venezuela says its armed forces have suffered casualties in fighting with irregular Colombian armed groups in the past 72 hours. Defense Minister Vladimir Padrino says clashes took place in the west of the border town of La Victoria. In a statement, Padrino said the Venezuelan forces killed and captured many fighters of the armed groups. He accused the groups of seeking to export their narco-paramilitary model to Venezuela to destabilize the country. However, the defense minister did not specify the number of casualties to either side. Thousands of Venezuelans have crossed the border into Colombia since fighting in the western state of Apur broke out in late March. At least 17 people have been found dead on a migrant boat off El Jairo in Spain's Canary Islands. Spain's Maritime Rescue Service said that three other people were rescued. It said an Air Force helicopter had been deployed to airlift the survivors. Authorities say the two men and one woman were taken to hospital. Rescue services said the vessel was spotted nearly 500 kilometers southwest of El Jairo. In Crimea, blooming peach gardens alongside the southern coast have become an excellent backdrop for a costume ball. Details in this report. Although spring has been late this year and peach trees just began to bloom, they are as beautiful as ever. A costume ball is being held at the Blooming Peach Gardens near Ternovka village in the Crimean Peninsula. Dozens of couples dance the walls, square mazurka and other classic styles. Works by Johann Strauss, Pyotr Tchaikovsky, Wolfgang Mozart and other famous classical composers were played for the participants. Organizers say they wanted to preserve the beauty of Crimean nature and ball dancing, which organically came in tune with each other through the event. Australian researchers are attempting to reverse the decline of elusive species of platypus. The semi-aquatic animal is increasingly under threat from extreme weather events. More in this report. It only takes a rustle and splash of an orange boy floating on the Thorn River for these scientists to know they have found what they're looking for, the elusive platypus. Famed for its bill, webbed feet and venomous purse, the platypus is one of only two egg-laying mammals in the world. Many Australians have never seen one in the wild. The researchers capture the platypuses with nets, tranquilize them and attach electronic tags. They take blood and urine samples, a biopsy for genetics and cheek pouch and fur samples to gauge the platypus diet. If we want to dive into the finer details of how the population is doing and tracking change over time, then we really need to try and, and catch the platypuses and have a close look first in terms of uh, estimating the population size. You can't do that with the DNA. You have to go through the hard effort of catching and tagging and releasing and doing that over. Researchers say rivers and creeks need to be protected and revegetated for a healthy population of the mammal. As a study last year found that platypus numbers have dropped as much as 30 percent. Their habitat has shrunk by more than a fifth in the last 30 years. But the scientists believe they can still save the animal. With the platypus, um, we are, you know, getting increasing evidence that they are declining. But I think um, we've got a really unique opportunity that if we intervene now, um, that we can really prevent those extinctions in the future and hopefully the platypus will be around for many more generations. Besides extreme weather, dams, land clearing and diversion of waterways have also affected the population. Cattle have destroyed riverbanks critical for platypus burrows, while invasive animals, 
fishing nets and plastic rubbish have also affected the species. Asia-Pacific stocks are mostly down as investors observe caution ahead of central bank's policy decisions in Japan and the U.S. Japan's Nikkei 225 has slipped close to half a percent. Mainland Chinese shares sales Kospi and the ASX 200 in Australia have also shed fractionally. However, Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index has edged up marginally. Now it's time to have a look at the weather update across the globe. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at indus.news.